While the name Dracula is familiar to most people, few know the real-life ruler that inspired Bram Stoker's character. Vlad Tepes, or the Impaler, would shock even his contemporary rulers in an age where terror was the norm. Vlad III was born in 1431 to Vlad II Dracul, who became the ruler of Wallachia in modern-day Romania in 1436. This was the age of the Great Ottoman Expansion under Mehmed II. Wait a minute, so Vlad III was the son of Vlad Dracul? Is that where Dracula comes from? Well, yes, but it's a bit like a telephone game. Vlad Dracul was made a member of the Order of the Dragon by Sisigmund of Luxembourg, King of Hungary, and Holy Roman Emperor. Being a member of this order, Vlad II took the surname Dracul, meaning the dragon in Old Romanian and the devil in the modern language. When Vlad III grew up, he became Vlad Dracula, the son of Dracul. So it wasn't a nickname given to him in the aftermath of his horrors, but it may as well have been because Vlad Dracula would make the Ottomans shiver. Vlad spent the first part of his childhood with his younger brother Radu and Targoviste at their father's royal court. They were educated by Constantinople scholars, well versed in math, science and language. Young Vlad spoke Latin, German and Old Church Slavonic. Soon, he would speak Turkish. Vlad Dracul had lost his throne to a Hungarian rival and he decided to make a pact with the Ottomans in order to secure the throne again. Sultan Mehmet II agreed to an arrangement where Vlad would pay a yearly tribute to the Ottoman Empire. He would also have to leave his sons, Vlad III and Radu, at the Ottoman court as a gesture of loyalty. Prisoners of Mehmed II, the boys were taught the Turkish language and customs. However, Vlad learned something else while he was there. The instrument of fear as a political means to an end. Vlad Dracul had regained his throne with the help of the Turks, but it wouldn't be long until he lost it again to the Hungarians. In 1447, John Hunyadi, governor of Hungary, broke into Wallachia and assassinated Vlad Dracul and his eldest son, Mircea. Unlike his brother Radu, Vlad III never accepted Turkish culture or religion. Even so, having had him as a guest slash prisoner for years, Mehmet II helped Vlad take the throne as ruler of Wallachia in 1448, after his father's death. Vlad Tepes would rule three times, fully earning his terrifying nickname. Wallachia was a powerful state positioned between two more powerful ones, the Ottomans and the Hungarians. Vlad was stuck between choosing one alliance or the other in order to consolidate his power. Soon after claiming the throne with Ottoman support, Vlad was dethroned by the Hungarians. He fled to Moldavia, where he lived under the protection of his uncle Bogdan II. Bogdan had mounted the throne with John Hunyadi's support, just to paint a picture of how complicated politics were in medieval Romania. In 1451, Bogdan was assassinated. Vlad and Bogdan's son, Stefan, went to Transylvania to seek assistance from Hunyadi in regaining their thrones. But the Hungarians were supporting Vladislav II, who they had made ruler in Wallachia. However, Vladislav II's shifting loyalties between the Hungarians and the Turks led Hunyadi to stop supporting him. By 1456, Hunyadi tasked Vlad with defending the Transylvanian border from the Ottoman invasion. 1453 had seen the fall of Constantinople under Mehmed II, and Europe had to take defense seriously. This was the beginning of Vlad the Impaler. In August 1456, Vlad invaded Wallachia and won against Vladislav III in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was finally ruler of Wallachia once again. Vlad's first move was to help his cousin Stefan consolidate his power in Moldavia. Together, they built a powerful stronghold against the Turkish invasion. Vlad's early years were defined by treachery and overthrowing. Now it was time for revenge. He lost his wife, he lost his dynasty, he lost his family, and he signed a document in order to bring a curse down against uh, his enemy. And he promised that he will return. That okay. was his curse and I will take revenge against those that they betrayed me. He gathered information on all nobles who had been involved in overthrowing him and his father. He invited these nobles, along with their families, to an Easter feast. 
There, the traitors were arrested and impaled in front of their families. This was a method known for its cruelty even in those times. The sticks would avoid the enemy's vital organs, leading to a slow, horrible death. Crows and ravens would sometimes start feasting on the men while they were still alive. Indeed, Vlad Dracula didn't just impale Ottoman Turks, but any subject of Wallachia who would deviate from his strict laws. Beggars and thieves were at the top of this list. Once, Vlad invited all the beggars in Wallachia to a glorious feast in a wooden hall in the main square. He let the beggars eat. Then he ordered the door shut and the building set on fire. This was a way of removing poverty from the land. But of course, what Vlad the Impaler is most known for is, well, impaling Ottoman Turks. In 1460, Pope Pius II started a new crusade to reclaim Constantinople. The crusade was led by Matthias Corvinus, son of John Hunyadi and King of Hungary. Vlad's interest aligned with Matthias's, wanting to defend his kingdom from the Ottomans. He allied with Matthias, but he was the only ruler in Central and Eastern Europe who did. Mehmed II knew, and the Ottomans continued to conquer lands from Serbia to Greece. Mehmed II wanted Wallachia too. He declared it to be part of the Ottoman Empire. As such, he sent envoys to Vlad's castle in order to collect a tribute of 10,000 ducats, along with 500 men to be taken into the Turkish army. This wouldn't be the first time, as Wallachia was in and out of suzerainty from the Turks for the whole duration of the Ottoman Empire. However, Vlad refused to pay tribute. Had he ever agreed that the Turks were his suzerains? Not to say the delegates refused to lift their turbans as a sign of respect. So Vlad drove nails through their turbans and into their skulls. Mehmed II sent his army across the Danube into Wallachia, but Vlad caught the soldiers off guard and impaled them. In 1461, Vlad proposed a negotiation with Sultan Mehmed II. Mehmed II planned an ambush and sent Hamza, one of his best generals, along with a thousand men to Wallachia. But Vlad met them at a narrow pass and massacred their army, leaving behind, once again, a forest of impaled enemies. Vlad would go in advance to fortify towns and use his skills in the Turkish language to encourage the guards to open the gates. Then his army would pour in from over the horizon. Vlad would then go into a killing frenzy. Every Turkish man, woman or child that he could find. On February 11th, 1462, Vlad wrote to Matthias Corvinus. We killed more than 23,884 Turks and Bulgarians without counting those whom we burned in homes or the Turks whose heads were cut off by our soldiers. Your Highness, you must know I have broken the peace with the Sultan for the honor of the King and for the preservation of Christianity. What Mehmet II did next still puzzles historians. He sent 150,000 men to Wallachia an army that, according to Greek historian Lyonikos Chalkankodiales, was only second in size to the one that took Constantinople in 1453. However, Mehmed had promised Radu, Vlad's younger brother, the Wallachian throne. So if the Ottomans didn't seek to take the throne for themselves, was this army intended just for Vlad Dracula? The Ottoman fleet arrived at Brala, the Danube Delta port where Vlad had defeated them before. But this time, Vlad's army was outnumbered five to one. Also, the Wallachian daggers were pretty rudimentary compared to the Ottoman siege and missile weaponry. Oh, and Vlad's army comprised mostly peasants and shepherds who didn't wear any armor. It was his intelligence that would see him win a seemingly impossible battle. Vlad Tepes would lead his famous night attack, which inspired Ramsay Bolton's very similar maneuver in Game of Thrones. First, he poisoned the waters and created confusing marshes by diverting small rivers. He set traps and evacuated people and animals from the city for seven days. Then in the night, he sent men to attack generals and horses, removing the real threat from the Ottoman army. Oh yeah, he also sent people infected with bubonic plague into the Turkish camp. The plague spread quickly, decimating the starved and exhausted soldiers. On June 17, 1462, the Turks had camped outside Bucharest after failing to capture its fortress. During the night, Vlad walked into the camp disguised as a Turk, locating the Sultan's tent and learning the camp's organization. 
Within a few hours, 24,000 men raided the camp, destroying the unprepared Turkish army. The Wallachian army made terrifying noises, causing chaos among the Turks. They led several attacks in the same night, confusing and exhausting their enemies. Vlad failed to find the Sultan, but he entered the wrong tent. The next morning, Mohammed II marched to Targoviste, the Wallachian capital, where he found a deserted town and a forest of impaled Turks. The 23,844 Vlad had decimated during his Bulgarian campaign. The Sultan's army entered into an area of the impalements, which was 17 stadiums long and 7 stadiums wide. The Sultan said that it was not possible to deprive of his country a man who had done such great deeds, who had such a diabolical understanding of how to govern his realm. There were infants too, affixed to their mothers on the stakes, and birds had made their nests in their entrails. Vlad left for Transylvania, seeking help from Matthias Corvinus in the battle against the Ottomans. But Vlad's relationship with the Saxons of Transylvania had taken a turn for the worse. After he had impaled pretty much everyone who ever went against him, Matthias had Vlad captured and imprisoned for 12 years at the Visegrad castle. Matthias' attitude towards Vlad was not necessarily hostile. He allowed Vlad to marry his cousin, Justina Shizigil. It was also at his castle that Vlad had the infamous portrait painted, a portrait that inspired Bram Stoker's character and the vampire image in popular culture. In 1476, Matthias sent a recently freed Vlad to fight against the Ottoman army, allowing him to regain the throne as Prince of Wallachia. He made an alliance with his cousin, Stefan of Moldavia, driving the Ottoman-imposed ruler Besarab away. But within a few weeks, Vlad was dead, aged 45. It could have been Bessarab, or the local nobleman, afraid of what Vlad would do to them for betraying him. Vlad Dracula's cunning and cruelty inspired Yvonne the Terrible, vampires, and several Game of Thrones scenes. Doesn't the Red Wedding resemble the Beggar's Feast? Was he just a tough ruler, fitting in the context of medieval warfare, or were his methods truly outstanding even at that time? Let us know what you think in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.